Tēnā koutou katoa. Good afternoon and welcome to the final day of COVID-19 Alert Level 4. I'll ask Dr Bloomfield to begin with an update for you all. Thank you Prime Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, today we have just one new confirmed case of COVID-19 to report and there are four new probable cases. All of those cases today can be traced to a known source. Three are linked to the St Margaret's Hospital and uh, Rest Home uh, cluster in Auckland and two are linked to other known cases. In the context of our overall total, six cases which were previously probable have been reclassified as either still under investigation or not a case. So this means our current national total is now 1,469 and that's a net reduction of one. The, confirmed, the total confirmed cases is 1,122. This is the number we report to the World Health Organisation and it is also the number that many countries report publicly as their total number of cases. For example, Australia. So this number at the moment, 1,122, is the number that is comparable to those of other jurisdictions, including Australia. The reason why some of those probable cases have been reclassified is because public health units are working with us to review recent probable cases. Some uh, of these, for example, have been classified as probable cases as part of a precautionary approach around clusters or existing cases, particularly over this last few weeks. Uh, this means then we put any, cl we identify close contacts and we put them in self-isolation while they are being investigated. We found then uh, in going back and reviewing those cases, especially in some instances where they have repeated negative tests, that they no longer should be classified as probable cases. And we will continue to do that uh, over these next few weeks to help get a really good picture of what our total case number is. We will continue to report each day the number of confirmed and new probable cases and the net total. Yesterday there were 2,939 laboratory tests processed. Our combined total to date is 123,920 and the lower number of tests yesterday, as you will know, fits the pattern we do see on weekends. Of our cases, 1,180 are reported as recovered, an increase of 38 on yesterday, and this means around 80% of our cases are now recovered. Today there are seven people in hospital, again unchanged from yesterday, and this includes one person in intensive care in Middlemore. Very sadly, we have one additional death to report today, which takes our total number of deaths related to COVID-19 to 19. A woman in her 90s who was a resident at St Margaret's Hospital and Rest Home died yesterday in Waitakere Hospital. Our thoughts are obviously with her family at this very sad time. This woman was a confirmed case of COVID-19 and had a number of underlying health conditions. She was one of a group of residents transferred to Waitakere Hospital earlier in the month and is the third person from that cluster to have died. Her family have expressed their gratitude to the Waitakere Hospital staff who cared for their loved one. There are still 16 significant clusters and again this is no change from yesterday. We have only one case since the 1st of April where we are still investigating the source of infection. This is a confirmed case in Tauranga and a possible link is still being investigated. A second case that was in Waikato uh, that we had reported on in the last few days is now no longer considered a case. Uh, that person was a probable case but following further investigation is no longer classified as such. Just a note on how we manage cases and close contacts under Alert Level 3. There will be ongoing strict isolation and monitoring around all confirmed and probable cases. All confirmed and probable cases will continue to be managed in quarantine or, or managed self-isolation if they are recent arrivals into New Zealand or will be under strict self-isolation and active management if already in New Zealand. Active management of cases and self-isolation uh, means there are daily phone calls to check on the health and welfare needs of people, including any symptoms they may have. And likewise, the same process happens with all close contacts. Daily uh, contact is made to ensure they are um, undertaking the mandatory self-isolation for 14 days to check on symptoms and indeed any welfare needs they have. 
Uh, a new Health Act order comes to an effect, into effect from 11.59 tonight uh, when New Zealand moves to Alert Level 3. This uh, new Section 71 uh, notice under the Health Act uh, is available on the Ministry of Health website and contains very detailed information about the constraints on activity uh, under Alert Level 3 and also um, how permissions are granted for certain activities. And finally, uh, just a reminder to people who have any health needs, uh, and in particular those that are not related to COVID-19, please do not delay seeking care from your GP or through the Healthline number 0800 611 116. That is the regular Healthline number. And as usual, if it is an emergency, please do call 111. Uh, and if you get an appointment, an appointment from your District Health Board uh, in coming days for an investigation or to go in for treatment, uh, please do take up that uh, invitation. Uh, we can assure you that hospitals will be operating uh, with everyone's safety in mind, including those of patients, families and, of course, staff. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Dr Bloomfield. We are now 11 hours away from the lifting of Level 4 and of the strictest constraints placed on New Zealanders in modern history. It's been nearly five weeks living and working in ways that just two months ago would have seemed impossible, but we did and we have done it together. Let me th run through a few of the numbers that show how far we've come, the figures that we've been working towards in order to be able to confidently move to level three. Our testing has uh, grown from obviously zero pre-COVID-19 to the capacity to process up to 8,000 tests per day. That's resulted in us having one of the highest testing rates in the world per capita. We have a very low percentage coming back positive each, each day, as low as 0.05% last week and only 0.17% today. This provides strong evidence that there is not widespread transmission that is going undetected. The virus has a transmission rate of around 2.5 in most places without controls. Under lockdown, this has dropped to 0.4, less than half a person infected by each individual. And for the last few days, our cases have been in the single digits, with, as you will have heard from Dr Bloomfield today, just one confirmed case. It is worth pausing to digest those numbers. They are incredible, and they are thanks to the sacrifices that every single New Zealander has made. As we entered uh, Level 4, Modelling from Professor Sean Hendy gave us insights into a scenario in which we did not lock down. And in that scenario, our steady case numbers seeded an epidemic that potentially would have seen a period of as many as 1,000 cases per day. We will never know what would have actually have happened without our level four restrictions, but we can look overseas and see that this devastating scenario has played out in many other countries. Through our cumulative actions, we have avoided the worst. Tragically, what we have been unable to stop is the loss of 19 New Zealanders to COVID-19. Numbers, of course, mean nothing to their family and loved ones and nothing can take away their grief. All I can do or say again to those people is that our thoughts and sympathies are with you. We send them our love in their time of loss. As we do to anyone who has lost someone during lockdown and may have been unable to be with them or to farewell them as they would have wished. This has been one of, I think, the hardest elements of Level 4. Of course, the ambition we all have is to confidently reach the position where we can bring back the social contact that we all miss. But to do it confidently, we need to move slowly and we need to move cautiously. We must make sure that we do not let the virus run away on us again and cause a new wave of cases and deaths. To succeed, we must hunt down the last few cases of the virus. This is like looking for a needle in a haystack and we need your help to finish the job we have started. There is no widespread undetected community transmission in New Zealand. We have won that battle, but we must remain vigilant if we're to keep it that way. That includes safely returning more New Zealanders to work, enabling more businesses to reopen, and allowing some of the recreational activities we've missed in the past four weeks. As you will have heard me say repeatedly, it is not and cannot be a return to pre-COVID-19 life. That day will come, but it is not here yet. 
To get there, our team of 5 million needs to have zero tolerance for cases to complete our goal of eliminating the virus at level three. If you're unwell, stay home. If you have a runny nose, a sore throat, a cough, get a test. Let's make sure that we keep those testing rates up. We continue with our contact tracing and isolation. That's how we'll finish this job. As you know, we will be at level three for two weeks before Cabinet makes a further decision on next steps on Monday the 11th of May. In order to consider a move to level two, we'll consider the same factors we have for previous moves, continued extensive testing and what that's telling us, continuing with our rapid contact tracing, understanding exactly where each new case came from and how it connects to our existing cases, and confidence that we do not have undetected community transmission. I am optimistic that we can continue on a path of success, but let me be clear about two things. First, we can only do this if we all continue to pull together. And secondly, I will not risk the gains we've made in the health of New Zealanders. So if we need to remain at level three, we will. Our priority, as it has been throughout these recent weeks, is the health of New Zealanders, because that's also the way that we can protect livelihoods. Of course, we've also put measures in place to cushion the economic impact by keeping as many New Zealanders in jobs as possible and by providing assistance to ensure as many Kiwi businesses as possible remain viable. We'll continue to do this, but I know what everyone wants is a return to the day when that is no longer required either. Before I conclude, a quick overview of how we'll be running the week ahead. Tomorrow, Cabinet meets from 10am. The House sits Tuesday to Thursday from 2 till 6pm with question time and other business, including a ministerial statement on Tuesday. Today will be the last day of the regular joint press conferences between myself and the Director General of Health. I know that many people around the country have regularly tuned in to receive information and advice during Level 4. And so that's why I want to preserve my thanks for the day to Dr Bloomfield. I consider New Zealand to be very lucky to have a public servant of Dr Bloomfield's calibre leading the health response. His background in public health has meant I consider New Zealand uh, to be amongst those countries who are lucky to have that expertise uh, in leading our response, one that considers the health and well-being of New Zealanders in every respect. Uh, and so, Dr Bloomfield, it's been a real honour. It won't be the last time you see us both up here, but the last of the regular times. And I thank the team that supports Dr Bloomfield as well. From tomorrow, the Ministry of Health will continue their daily updates at 1pm. I'll return to my normal schedule of post-Cabinet press conferences and daily media stand-ups separately before the House. And most days there will be government announcements from this podium as we move through Level 3 and increase our focus on the government's economic response to the virus. I anticipate at the time that we make announcements on whether or not we're moving from Level 3 that again I'm likely to be joined by Dr Bloomfield at that point. Finally, please remember the rules for Level 3. And now that you have the opportunity, please, if you are taking part in a bit of contactless retail over the coming days, think about your local businesses. They need all our support. Happy to take your questions. Prime Minister, with the, about uh, contactless Jessica, yeah. with the contactless tracing that you talked about yeah. um, last week, where are we at? Are we at that gold standard that you both talked about last week? For contact tracing, we have scaled up a significant amount. We have the ability to make as many as 10,000 calls a day, if that is required. Uh, of course, what we want to do is make sure that we are as successful as we can be. So we can do our part with having the capacity. Now we're asking New Zealanders to do yours. Record where you've been, who you've been with, and that will make our job all easier. Dr Bloomfield, you might wish to say more on that. Uh, yes, two comments, Prime Minister. One is I did have a, a full update from my team at the end of last week on progress with um, both the rollout and also the response to um, Dr Verrill's recommendations, and they're progressing very well. I, and the second thing is I've asked them to um, invite Dr Verrill back in during this week to talk her through uh, what um, further action has has um, been completed uh, and just to get her further um, reflections and any further suggestions she has. At gold standard, do you feel confident going? we can go into level three safely, like you said last mm. week? Yes, I do feel very confident we can do that. And uh, there are two reasons for that. One is 
I've had my team out during the week visiting three of our public health units who have been uh, actually at the forefront of some of the contact tracing, well, case uh, management and contact tracing. And uh, it's clear that they have scaled up considerably with that first amount of money that was made available, and they know exactly what that further they need to do to scale up. So at the moment, they can themselves trace 185 uh, cases a day and uh, looking to scale that up to 300 and then our, uh, being able to link electronically with our national contract tracing centre and link all the data including lab data th and so on through NHI number will allow us to scale up to that that target we still have of a thousand cases per day if needed. So yes to gold standard? Yes I believe we are at that point. Close contacts of positive COVID cases has the Ministry been un unable to reach? In total, over the entire course of our action against COVID-19, uh, in total, we'd need to go back and look at some of those details, keeping in mind that some of the probables that have been announced in, uh, even in recent weeks have included individuals that we've identified after they're no longer symptomatic. And that's been part of our work as we've identified a confirmed case. They may have people in their household that have displayed symptoms that we then determine to be probable. Uh, and so sometimes, actually in those cases, the data around contact tracing will look like it has a long lag time won't actually be an accurate reflection of what's happened in a household. Yeah. Yeah. The average time, the average amount of time it takes to complete contact tracing um, for a, a confirmed case, to fully complete contact, contact tracing for them. Of course, we want that window to be as narrow as possible. So the goal that we're working towards, of course, is you're wanting that contact tracing to be in that first 48 hour period. Uh, but for that to be successful, it means someone needs to come forward very early on when they're manifesting symptoms, the turnaround of their test needs to be quick, and then the contact tracing around them needs to equally be very fast. You'll see from the fact that every day when we come down, we can describe to you where someone has contracted COVID from, that those first interviews happen very, very quickly. The success of reaching people around those cases will all come down to whether someone knows who they were contact with, knows their names, and we're then able to find them. I just want to follow that up, Prime Minister. So what we've seen over the period of time is, and particularly as we've been in Alert Level 4, and we want this to continue into Alert Level 3, hence the importance of people uh, recalling where they have been and, and making a note of that. Very early on when we had uh, the cases first arriving, contact tracing was much more difficult because people may have been in a range of different locations. And here's an example. We might have got an email at the Ministry that said, um, this person caught a bus from Auckland to Taupo uh, with this company uh, and then there was a lot of work that would need to go on to find out uh, with the company who else was on the bus to try and find contact details. Clearly that's been very different in Alert Level 4 and as we ex move into Alert Level 3 and the number of potential close contacts for people expands, it's very important that we understand so that if we do have cases just who those close contacts are and that's part of the reason we're stepping cautiously. On that, are you concerned about creating new potential chains of transmission from all of these bubbles in Level yeah. 3 expanding? And this is why I cannot, uh, I cannot emphasise this enough. With Level 3, there are new risks. People are going back into their workplaces and that will extend the number of people they have contact with. That's why we ask that you still keep your distance as much as you're able from those who are in your workplace and to reduce the risk further, make sure you stick to your bubble at home. We are opening up the economy, um, but we're not opening up people's social lives for the very reason that we need to reduce down our risk as much as possible. We are extending bubbles though, aren't we? So for example, in a house of flatmates where someone's parents are now coming over, <clears throat> and then another flatmate has a partner visiting or another flatmate might just have a friend coming over, you're getting a whole lot of different groups. And in those you'll recall that we've said, we want any extension to someone's existing bubble to be small. I would uh, encourage anyone who's in a shared household, like a flatting situation, to think carefully about what that means for them. Uh, we're talking about necessary contact. Uh, we're talking about, for instance, a caregiver if you need, or if you've got someone in your life who is isolated and has had no contact with anyone else. But for a household like a, f uh, a flatting situation, they do need to think cautiously and act cautiously. Yeah. Field, can I ask why the Ministry stopped classifying cases as community transmission on the website? Uh, yes, what you'll see on the website is now we've got a, a, a different classification because um, what's become important is uh, 
and, and the Prime Minister's talked about this, is whether we know where the case has come from. And of course, as we've been in Alert Level 4, we've got, two t we've got effectively two types of cases. Uh, people who are arriving into the country from overseas who go into quarantine or self-isolation and people who have become a case because they've been exposed to someone already here. And what we're doing now is classifying them so that we can give essentially more useful information about whether that has been um, uh, the, the transmission from an existing case, either as part of a cluster or not, and where we can track back as to where the exposure might have happened, or whether we can't. And as I said earlier on, we've only got that one case since the 1st of April where um, even then there's a strong suspicion, but we can't um, necessarily trace where that infection happened. So does, that, does that mean we're basically on the brink of elimination? And, and what targeted testing is, um, is, is being planned for that time? Yes, that does give us confidence that we've achieved our goal of, of elimination, which d never, never meant zero, uh, but it does mean we know where our cases are coming from. Uh, and there will be ongoing uh, focused and extensive testing through into Alert Level 3 and beyond with two aims. First of all, to rapidly identify any cases, hence uh, the importance of anyone with symptoms seeking advice and being tested. But secondly, uh, that surveillance testing, which is real, will be will be targeted to, in particular, um, uh, get good spread across geographical regions, different ethnic groups, and in particular workplaces, like hospitals, like aged residential care, uh, where essential non-health essential workers like supermarkets may have exposure to a lot of people. So we'll be quite systematic about that testing, and there's a, a plan around that. And each DHB is currently. Uh, providing us with their plans about how they're going to do that in their region. Yeah, just clarify, does, do you mean that you consider um, COVID-19 now eliminated in the uh, I, I would say Currently. that, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what I would say is that our goal is elimination. And again, that doesn't mean eradication, but it means we get down to a small number of cases and so that we are able to stamp out any cases and any outbreaks that might come up. and. Uh, if you think about Alert Level 4, I would say we've achieved through Alert Level 4 the position we wanted to be into so that, in, so that we could now start to move down Alert Levels. Is eradication a possibility in New Zealand? Uh, it's a possibility. Uh, however, um, what we also know, and as we see with, the, with, with these ongoing cases, even after four weeks in lockdown, and I've said this before, this is a tricky virus, and um, that's why we, we're not going to reduce our vigilance one bit. If anything, we and other New Zealanders need to increase our vigilance to make sure we maintain our current um, state, because it's that that will be uh, directly, you know, will directly um, uh, impact on whether or not we can mm. and when we can shift down alert levels further. It's interesting when you see other countries, uh, um, particular. Uh, in particular, who have got down to a lower levels or other places that have got down to lower levels, you see a tail. Um, and that tail is particularly tricky when you get down to those small numbers in the same, same way that New Zealand uh, is now. So as we've said, elimination means we may well uh, reach zero, but we may well then have small numbers of cases coming up again. Um, that doesn't mean we have failed. It just means that we are in the position to have that zero tolerance approach uh, to uh, have a very aggressive management of those cases and keep those numbers low and um, uh, fading out again. How likely is that Trans-Tasman travel bubble and if it was feasible, when would that likely happen? That's been discussed at a, at a senior level between myself, Pierre Morrison, um, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and his counterpart. And I think what we all agree is that uh, that is a situation we would all like to be in. Uh, but of course, our number one focus at the moment is making sure that uh, both our countries are in the uh, ha are in the position where we're domestically managing COVID-19 uh, to a point where we can, with confidence, open those borders. We're not yet that, uh, but we're keeping that in mind. When realistically could that happen? And also, could we see that extended perhaps to other Pacific Island neighbours? Yeah, one thing I'm not willing to do is jeopardise the position that New Zealand has got itself into by moving too soon to open our borders up, even to uh, Australia um, uh, at present. That is something, though, that we absolutely are keeping in mind, that we'd like to work towards. But I think both countries need to feel confident that we can do that without putting at risk uh, either country's health or economy.
Pacific Islands nations? I'll put them in the same category. We do have to be particularly cautious. Uh, our Pacific neighbours, in large part, have not been afflicted by COVID-19, and the last thing we would want is to risk that. What about opening New Zealand up to Australian citizens um, uh, on, the, on the basis that they uh, quarantine yeah. as New Zealand citizens do? Because yep. Yep. there are Australians living in the country, yep. uh, their families come to And I see that as a very likely prospect. Uh, of course, we're using quarantine at the moment to make sure that we can safely return New Zealanders. And if we're in a position uh, where we're wanting to open uh, to um, up to New Zealanders, uh, sorry, those who are living in Australia currently who wish to come into New Zealand but are willing to quarantine themselves, then that is something that we could consider. Uh, we need to keep in mind, though, constantly maintaining the capacity to do that safely and to do that well. So on another, uh, yeah. on another Australia, um, related matter, um, they've launched the app in the last 24 hours. Yeah. Could we have an update on how the New Zealand app is going? Yeah, so progress continues. I would point out that the Australian app, as I understand, is very similar to the Singaporean app. And I think one thing uh, that uh, globally we're seeing acknowledgement of is that it is not a replacement uh, for human and one-on-one -on -one contact tracing between uh, someone who works in our public health units and someone who has COVID-19. And that is because it requires a large proportion of your population to be using the app. And even if it has data between two people who have been in contact with one another, uh, it picks up people at such a distance that you still want to verify and some of the technology that's being talked about at the moment uh, bypasses uh, uh, public health or health authorities. It means that you could potentially have uh, people who are being told they need to self-isolate who may not have been in quite close proximity and only human questioning will be able to determine that. So there are frailties with the system. We're still working on it. We want it to supplement what we're already doing. But the first phases of what you'll see in New Zealand uh, will be the foundations rather than straight away the Bluetooth application. Sorry? Uh, soon. <laughs> Um, but again, I'd say that um, don't expect the first iteration to include things like Bluetooth applications, uh, because there are other pieces of information that we think would be useful to support our contact tracing in New Zealand. Prime Minister, on universities, uh, I'll come to Jessica. Oh, Prime Minister, on universities, what's your message to those universities who are still charging students that aren't actually using their rooms and halls of residence? Oh, I haven't got a lot of detail on how often or how widespread that is, um, but one of the things that we, the message we have strongly been sharing to anyone uh, who's in a position where they've got tenants, um, be they commercial or residential, is to apply compassion at this time. It is a tough period for everyone, and we want to see humanity in everyone's approach. When you say compassion, you mean they shouldn't be charged if they're not there for and students? I yeah, and I can't comment on individual circumstances, but that's been our general approach uh, for those uh, who are, for instance, calling on the resources of others who have been affected by COVID-19 uh, or who might not, uh, for instance, have the income at this time to meet some of the, the ongoing costs that they have. Minister, Can you clarify a couple of things? Prime, Prime yeah. Minister, uh, Housing Minister Megan Ward announced over the weekend $107 million added funding for housing. She said in the PR, since the alert levels were put in place, more than 1,100 motel units have been secured for people living rough and homeless. This was secured by the government, government agencies. When looking to go down to level two and level one, will the government consider utilising marae and financing marae to provide that accommodation, given that it, it appears to be a more cost-effective way to do it and also would benefit those local marae? Mm. Uh, of course, marae have been used in the past, particularly when we've reached crisis situations in the winter. What we've found is that, uh, of course, through the impacts of COVID-19, our access now to housing options has widened. And so, yes, we have in the past used motels, for instance. Now we're able to access even better facilities than we have in the past. And we're housing a large number of people who have been chronically homeless who have not been housed before. The trick and the key for us will be maintaining that. That's been one of the, one of the small benefits of this experience is, has been our ability to get people into housing. We need to hold on to that. And I would expect um, our uh, officials and departments to keep working with Marae and others who traditionally have provided more than just a house, but wraparound service as well. Dr. Can you, can you, can you, can you um, just tell us what services uh, hospitals and 
DHBs will be bringing back this week. And will that be up to individual DHBs to decide or will they have steering from the Ministry? Uh, so I can speak to the second point. Uh, the, there is certainly a, um, clear guidance from the Ministry and we've been working on a daily basis with district health boards uh, around that transition into Level 3. There's quite detailed information on our website, not just about hospitals, but about other community-based providers and what services will be available and how people can access them. I guess the key principle for district health boards uh, and their hospitals over coming uh, days will be uh, starting to move back to providing um, more elective um, and planned services, both outpatient appointments and also um, potentially surgery and other procedures, uh, and then easing into that within the context of wanting to keep everyone safe. So making sure their infection prevention control procedures are all, uh, are all A1, and while still maintaining that ability, if necessary, to scale up a response to COVID. Yes, I can clarify about uh, things like uh, cancer diagnosis or existing conditions um, having deteriorated under well, there's no doubt that some people's care has been delayed um, during Alert Level 4, and uh, that includes delay in the delivery of some procedures, including both diagnostic and treatment procedures. And there's been some excellent work done between um, uh, Diana Safati, the Acting Chief Executive of the Cancer Control Agency, and clinicians across the sector about how to reduce the likelihood of any um, harm resulting from that and in particular how to make sure as we go into alert level three that we can prioritise the investigations and treatment of people with cancer to make sure that they that uh, they are getting what they need and that work I think I'd commend and it's also on our website. I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come back to you Tover, I'll just make sure I grab a couple Dr. of extras. Dr. Bloomfield, we're um, still hearing stories of uh, asymptomatic elderly hospital patients unable to return to their rest homes because they can't get a COVID test and some of them are spending weeks unnecessarily on the ward. Is the Ministry going to change its advice or stance on this to, to resolve that problem? Actually, what I'm really interested in is working out uh, what it is we need to do to protect um, all uh, people already within our aged residential care facilities and those who may be being admitted or readmitted after they've been to hospital. And so I've reached out to the um, Aged Care Association to look at a piece of work um, as we move through Alert Level 3 and into Alert Level 2 as to what we really do need to do in that setting. We'll, we'll have learnt a lot about what's happened over the last few weeks with our clusters in aged residential care facilities, not just about the residents, but about staff as well, and how we need to support staff, um, including both at work and outside of work, to reduce any onward um, infection. And particularly around testing, what I'm really interested in too, is not just whether or not testing uh, uh, not just testing of people before they are admitted, but given they all go into isolation for 14 days, and the pattern we have seen here is with some of our folk inside age residential care who have tested positive but with no symptoms, as to whether it may be appropriate to do testing of these people during the time they are in isolation, and as well as that, do surveillance testing on other residents. So, so specifically to those, um, to those patients who are still on the ward and are thinking about going back into the, the rest homes, you're saying at the moment the solution is isolation for 14 days in that interim period and then working out something around testing. Yes, so the, the isolation for the 14 days has been in place right through Alert Level 4 and, and uh, we've agreed on that and that's something that happens even if someone is tested because it's clinically indicated and if the test is negative. If it's positive, of course, then they they're not admitted. If it's negative, then they still go into that 14-day isolation period. What I'm really interested in, and there's some um, uh, paper just published in the New England Journal of Medicine about the experience in the US where they've got actually t infection in 10% of their age residential care facilities is what ongoing testing is appropriate in this population which is high risk and also may not display symptoms or be able to describe their symptoms. Dr. Bloomfield, Bloomfield, what do you, you oh, Jason, and then I'll come back to you, Toba. Dr. Yeah. Bloomfield, what do you make of suggestions by some leaders overseas that people should be injecting themselves with bleach to kill COVID-19? <laughs> I don't think I need to comment on that, Prime Minister. No, I think probably we'll, we'll let your silence speak for itself. Mm. Toba? It is worth asking about, though, isn't it? Because there were cases... Is it? After, well, after the President raised it, there were cases in New York where people um, were 
having to um, go to medical facilities because they had actually ingested mm. disinfectants. Mm. And, I, and I know it's hard, you know you don't want to dignify this with a response, mm. but can you maybe just send a clear message to people that obviously that's not the thing to do? Indeed, but under no circumstances should they even think about doing that. I don't think we've had any suggestion of any reported cases in New Zealand of that occurring, and so that suggests to me that no New Zealander has uh, listened to or um, uh, given any any um, credence to that suggestion. President said that at all. Oh, obviously, um, uh, here in New Zealand, we haven't seen that uh, um, picked up, responded to, acted on in any way, and that's what we are, of course, here to do: is to look after the New Zealand population. A few things on behalf of people that have um, just asked us questions around Level Three. People have been told to keep to their local area under Level Three. How far can they drive to go to a beach or a park? Is it a thirty-minute trip okay, or an hour? Yeah, and look, the reason that we've asked people to stay regional, and that is a departure from level four, is because people will have to travel to work. So we haven't given specific, a uh, specific range in terms of kilometres because we do need to allow people to work, to, uh, move to their place of work, and that will vary. Uh, but ultimately, we're asking for the same common sense that we did at level four: stay um, close to your home, uh, stay in, uh, act in a way that reduces risk. Think about what will happen if your car breaks down, you run out of gas, or you have an accident somewhere. So keep as close to home as you can, keeping in mind you'll need to access work and in some cases school. And what about if, um, can people travel freely between their two bubbles as often as they like and can they stay overnight? Uh, again, when it comes to that advice around bubbles, we're asking that people keep it small and keep it exclusive. So it may include a caregiver, for instance. And so that will mean that you've got different uh, an arrangement that will include those caring duties. And we need to allow families uh, uh, to, to be flexible with that. But keep it exclusive, keep it small. Remember, this is all about reducing your contact with others as much as possible. There were new um, cases connected to the Rosewood cluster this week, uh, this weekend. Can you confirm that they include nurses? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that information, but, uh, but, uh, but, but I will get that. And we'll Prime, Minister, that. Prime Minister, are you yeah. looking forward to returning to the House tomorrow? Oh, look, look, we've been really mindful all the way through of making sure that we, uh, as much as possible, allow the ongoing scrutiny of the government and give the opportunity for the opposition to hold us to account, as is their, as is their duty. And so, uh, actually, unlike a, a number of other places, we've moved quite quickly to reopen the House, but to do it in a safe way, in the same way that other New Zealanders are with their workplaces. Can you give us an indication of any of the uh, emergency legislation that will need to be passed tomorrow for COVID? Um, so basically what you'll see with some of the omnibus legislation that will come through is essentially it will just contain some of the things we've already announced. So insolvency measures, um, some of those tax changes, um, there's been other areas where we've um, delayed um, the need to renew licences and so on. So it's really just making sure that we can enact some of the things we've already shared with you. Uh, just, two questions, uh, just two questions about yep, three. Yep. What's your understanding of how many New Zealanders are going to go effectively go back to work tomorrow over the couple of days? And secondly, I think a lot of what everyday Kiwis are looking forward to is the return of takeaways <laughs> and not having to cook every night. And so I just thought I'd ask what you are looking forward to eating most now that the street fresh chickens are in. We're expecting about 400,000 extra New Zealanders to enter into a workplace. Interestingly though, that brings us up to uh, a reduction in economic activity by, of about 25%. Um, so that is, that is uh, a significant increase, but keeping in mind we have managed to, of course, have people continuing to work in essential services through that time, and we've been able to do that safely. So we just ask that people continue with all of those lessons. Um, in terms of the things that will be new, contactless retail um, and including takeaway services, uh, for me, I think the thing that I'm actually looking forward to is really just the chance to support some small businesses. You know, I, for my local walks, uh, I walk up to Nakori Road and I see firsthand those cafes and places that have been closed down for um, a number of weeks and I'm just looking forward to a chance to, like everyone, show them a bit of love. Consideration in um, making our contact tracing app when it's really compatible with Australia's given possibility of that. Well, I did have some discussion there with PM Morrison around the fact that, of course, they've used the, the uh, essentially the app um, that's come out of Singapore. Uh, and so there is similar technology being looked at and utilised. So we, we too have uh, looked at the elements of the app from Singapore. So I imagine there may well be some similarities, but keep in mind, 
I think the number one consideration for opening up between New Zealand and Australia will be the fact that we have got COVID-19 under control. So the last thing you want is essentially just a shared system where we're all having to contact trace between ourselves because we haven't managed to get cases down. That back in Singapore, it was uh, you know, thought to have needed 80% take-up to be useful. Yes. Have we done any surveys and see any appetite for New Zealanders to... Yeah, yeah and look, to I have to say, um, from the outset, you will have heard us have enthusiasm for exploring um, technology to supplement what we're doing. But I uh, remain um, I, re I remain a bit sceptical around what it's going to be able to deliver because the, the uptake has to be so high. Uh, if I have the app on my phone, it will only work well if every single one of you in this room have the app as well in order for them to say as we've had a number of cases in the last week or two where the person's infection and symptoms actually started before the lockdown uh, and then um, another person may have presented with some uh, and been diagnosed and, by, and we've backtracked and found those people whose symptoms started uh, pre-lockdown or they've had symptoms, recovered and then become symptomatic again and have been tested at that point in time uh, and it's not clear whether their illness went away or whether they didn't have it in the first place but the good thing is, as I say, since the 1st of April, so now nearly uh, well, th over three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, we have not, we've only got that one case and, and even then we're quite confident about what the, trace, the trackability is back to where the infection happened. Okay. So there's been a reinfection then in that case? Uh, look, it, this is one of the, the big um, unknown um, questions and you'll see this being um, considered globally is whether people do develop immunity um, how long that might last for if they do, whether they can be reinfected, whether someone tests positive and then some weeks later tests positive, whether that m means they are still in able to infect others or it's just um, a carryover of some viral remnants. These are all things we will be watching very closely because they will impact on how we now manage our way through Alert Level 3 and into Alert Level 2. Okay, last question, Jackson. Our Prime Minister, will David Clark remain as Health Minister until the election? Oh, I've said that David Clark is our Health Minister and I have no intention to change that. Okay. Thank you, everyone.